Thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. Thanks for the, to the ABOL committee uh, for inviting me to give a lecture on this uh, wonderful opportunity. It's a, it's a pleasure. I've always been a great admirer of uh, Luis's work. So. Uh, I want to today um, give a sort of simple, simple introduction to some of the notions that um, are a, current, a recurrent theme in uh, Luis Caffarelli's uh, work, and they will be developed in uh, uh, some more details this afternoon by Alessio and Luis. Uh, and, and so uh, really the central theme, as you must have understood, is a, is a question of regularity, right? When can you say that uh, solutions to a partial differential equation are regular, and how regular are they? What is the optimal uh, regularity you can obtain uh, about them? So. Let us start again from something very basic that was uh, uh, also the, the starting point in uh, Luis's talk, which is the, the case of the simplest elliptic PDE, uh, Laplace's equation. So you know that uh, the Laplacian is the sum of uh, second derivatives in all the directions in uh, dimension D. And you know that if you have a solution of Laplacian U equals zero, it's called the harmonic function, then it's C infinity, which means it's infinitely uh, many times differentiable. And that maybe is a little bit surprising at first because the equation talks about the second derivatives of U but doesn't talk about higher derivatives of U. And yet we are able uh, to obtain information about all derivatives uh, of the function. All right, so why is that? So Luis uh, mentioned and emphasized this. It's because harmonic function, as you know, satisfies the mean value property. So you can think of the Laplacian as something that quantifies how much a function is different from its averages on a small balls, and in fact, a harmonic function is equal to its average uh, either on the surface of a sphere centered at the point or on the ball centered at the point. And so one way you can rephrase it is that u is equal to its convolution with any uh, radial and smooth mollifier. And from this you see that u has as much differentiability as the mollifier, so it's C infinity. Uh, and certainly uh, you've learned proofs like this in uh, complex variables, right? This is the same type of proof as for holomorphic functions, and you can also um, obtain uh, quantitative estimates on the derivatives of u at all order in terms of integrals of u on balls, like you would obtain for holomorphic function. Because a very uh, particular, you know, interesting feature of this equation is that uh, it is linear, it's an equation with constant coefficients, and so you can differentiate the equation. And so in particular, U is harmonic, but its derivatives satisfy the same equations. It's also harmonic. All its derivatives to any order are also harmonic. And when you use that uh, simple observation, you can get uh, these types of estimates, which, as I said, are the same as you obtain in complex uh, analysis, for instance. Okay, so if you think of uh, the equation with right-hand side, Laplacian U equals F now, uh, what happens is that u turns out to be twice more differentiable than f, right? So it depends on the right-hand side. And the, the model maybe is the ODE, so the situation of 1D, where you have u double prime equals f, that's Laplace's equation in 1D. So in 1D, it's kind of obvious, you can just integrate once and twice, and you see that uh, u has two orders of differentiability more than f. What is remarkable is that in higher dimension, this property persists with Laplacian, even though the Laplacian, in principle, doesn't control all the second derivatives of the function. It only controls a certain combination of the second derivatives. But this combination is, as you know, very particular and uh, has this property that it does, in the end, control, in some sense, all the second derivatives. It's the ellipticity of the operator that uh, plays the crucial role here. And that's why Laplace, the, the Laplacian operator is, is so fundamental. Of course, as you know, it's everywhere in physics uh, and, and in all applications of mathematics. 
So uh, we call this the regularizing property of the Laplacian. You can also have it for the heat equation, the time-dependent version of it, which is that U will be twice more differentiable than the right-hand side. And how uh, we like to measure it in analysis is often with uh, using holder spaces. So holder spaces uh, are a way to quantify uh, continuity, if you want. Uh, so we say that a function u is in the C0 alpha class if uh, you can have a quantitative continuity like that, that u of x minus u of y is controlled by a constant independent of x and y times x minus y to the alpha. And alpha can be uh, any exponent that's positive and less than one. Okay, so then you say that a function is CK alpha if its K's derivatives are uh, C0 alpha. All right, so the regularizing property of the Laplacian uh, can be seen uh, by saying that if F, the right-hand side here, is in CK alpha, then you will be CK plus 2 alpha. So you see you gain these two orders of differentiability. Um, let, let's mention the uh, probabilistic interpretation of the Laplacian because uh, it will be useful to make uh, analogies later. But I know that Luis, uh, the other Luis, uh, Luis Silvestre, will, uh, will give more, more uh, details about that this afternoon. Uh, but you may know this, if you do a random walk on ZD, which means you start from a point and you, uh, you toss a coin to tell you whether you're going to go up, right, left, or down, uh, independently and uniformly, then you do a random walk. And if you take this picture uh, and you sort of shrink it and scale it down, uh, you, you can obtain the Brownian motion as the limit. And you can view, interpret the Laplacian as uh, what's called the generator of the Brownian motion, which is the, the limit of the expectation under this Brownian motion of uh, the variation of u, u of x t minus u of x naught divided by t. So, so it's, it's, it's essentially how much you, you move uh, near your starting point uh, x months, or how, how the average of the, the change of uh, the function. Okay, so now we're gonna turn to uh, more difficult equations because they are no longer uh, with constant coefficients, right? Laplace's equation has constant coefficients. If you take any equation that has constant coefficients and maybe it's not exactly Laplacian, you, you can, as long as, the, as it's elliptic, you can make a change of variables to get back to Laplacian. So it's not really uh, different. But now let's look at things where uh, we have x dependent. And what is remarkable is that some of the regularizing properties that I discussed uh, before in the case of the Laplacians survive. And that's very interesting of course. So uh, a very important class of equations is what's called divergence form equations. And you see here, um, if you take the divergence of the gradient, that by, that then you find the Laplacian. But here we take the divergence of something that's called the flux, right? physically corresponds to a flux. You multiply the gradient this time by something which is not necessarily a, a function, which can even be a matrix. Right? So in principle, you can multiply the gradient by a matrix. It's called A, but it's A of x. So it depends on the point uh, in space. And it has to be positive definite uh, with a uniform uh, lower bound for this equation to remain elliptic, to be in the good class where we get this regularizing uh, property. So that's a very much studied um, equation, if you want to think of a probabilistic interpretation, you can see it as the generator of a random walk, but this time in some random environment. And there is a second uh, type of, uh, of, of um, x-dependent equation of second order that you can write, which will take this general form. Now it's the trace of A times the Hessian of U. Uh, so you see the, the coefficient is not inserted in the same place in terms of the differentiation. Here you insert the coefficient and you differentiate a second time. Here you differentiate twice and then you multiply by the coefficient matrix. So here A again is a matrix. It depends on the point and it has to be positive definite. So these things are called non-divergence form equations and Louis Cafferly has worked intensively on such equations. 
They can be uh, inserted into a broader class of fully nonlinear equations that Luis Silvestre will talk about uh, this afternoon. And uh, from a probabilistic point of view, you can see them as a more complicated type of random walk where the, the, the probability of jumps are node dependent in this uh, picture of, of, the, of the random walk on the grid that I was uh, drawing in the beginning. Okay, so let me uh, look a little bit at this divergence form equations, the first type of equations that I mentioned. And in fact, I want to give you a, a crash course in regularity theory. So a, a very short glimpse at the type of arguments that are employed to understand the regularity of such equations, because these are, there are themes in there, in at least to give you a flavor of things that have been, I think, um, uh, all along in, uh, in, in part of the, of the thinking uh, in the work of Louis Caffrelli. Um, but it dates back to um, uh, earlier names. In particular, you will see uh, that Georgie is a very important name in this business. Okay, so let's say we have an equation like that, and now our problem is that we have this uh, varying coefficient here, a of x. So there is uh, one first approach, which is to say, okay, if my coefficient uh, matrix A of X is continuous in X, then, you know, I know that a continuous function is almost constant locally, right? So A of X is going to be very close to A of X naught near X naught. And so maybe we can think of this as a perturbation of the constant coefficient equation. And if I have divergence of A of X naught times gradu, as I said, I can always make an affine change of variables to get back to the Laplacian. So in fact, if I'm back to the Laplacian, I know I have regularity, and then I can plug that in, then it will be a question of quantifying this sort of error, how much, you know, how, how much problems this, this approximation uh, creates. Um, and you can do that. You can obtain good regularity uh, theory like that, it's essentially Schauder estimates. But there is another approach which allows you to deal with coefficients which are not even continuous. And I think that came as a bit of a surprise, or it should be a surprise. That if you take a matrix uh, function A of X, which is only bounded measurable, okay, so let's say it's only bounded. It has to be a uh, uniformly positive definite matrix. I told you this is uh, the condition of ellipticity. So A of X has to be bigger than lambda identity for some fixed lambda that's positive and independent of the point. Then, despite this coefficient being possibly discontinuous, the solution, uh, the solutions, um, are continuous. So here we assume some, uh, something that we call an energy bound. So this is a, a natural uh, a bound to assume. You have to assume something because otherwise you cannot uh, obtain anything. But if you have an energy bound in a ball, so the unit ball, then the solution will be continuous and hold there continuous C0 alpha in a smaller ball. And there is some alpha positive uh, to this day, no one can prove what the optimal alpha is. Okay, so it's a very important, op still open problem in regularity theory. Okay, so this was developed by uh, De Georgi. Nash gave a parabolic version of this uh, type of theorem. Moser came back and also improved some stuff. Uh, so this is really fundamental, and, so, and, and many of these ideas um, also, as I say, appear in uh, Louis Caffrelli's uh, later work that I will uh, describe towards the end. So here comes the, the crash course about some of the ingredients that are involved in proving a theorem like this. So the first, uh, I would say that the, the, the key word is decay of oscillation. So we'll see that, what that means. So there is a first step which consists in proving that first your solution, you know, that you know in a unit ball, let's say, is bounded. So it has to be bounded above and below by some constants. So it's not going to be bounded in the whole ball, in the whole unit ball. You're going to have to go a little bit inside. 
The reason is here, I don't give myself any boundary data. So we don't know what U is doing at the boundary. And without some boundary data, you cannot say anything up to the boundary. You have to go a little bit inside. Okay? So let's say on the ball of radius three quarters. Three quarters is arbitrary, right? It's just because it's smaller than one. We prove that uh, the function is bounded above and below. What kind of tools do we have, by the way, to prove things about equations like that? Uh, what tools are used? There's not that many, and really the main idea is to find good multipliers uh, by which you're going to multiply the equation. We say test the equation. by a, So you multiply the equation by a function, and then you want to integrate by parts. That's pretty much uh, a lot of the starting points of the ideas. And here as well. Okay, second step, now that you know that your function is bounded above and below, you observe that the equation is actually invariant under adding constants, right? So the equation divergence of A gradu is equal zero. If you add a constant to you, you're still a solution. If you multiply U by a constant, you're also still a solution. So you can always assume by multiplying and adding that the minimum or let's say the infimum in that uh, smaller ball is zero and the supremum is one. Okay, then comes a third step, which is this proposition called density estimate. And it says the following, if you know that you have your solution now in a three, three quarters, which is bounded below by zero, above by one, so we can assume it's positive, right? Um, and if you know that basically the proportion of the volume of the ball where the function is above one half is bigger than uh, this constant rho for some positive rho, then the infimum of the function in an even smaller ball, b one half, is positive. It's, it's bounded below by a constant c. That will depend on rho, given here, the dimension, and the ellipticity constant, if you remember a lambda in my previous slide. So A of X is bounded below by lambda identity. So let me repeat again. You look at your function in a ball of radius three quarters. You know it's between zero and one. And you, you cut in the middle, basically one half is the middle between zero and one. And you look at you know, how much of the volume of the ball is occupied by uh, points where u is bigger than one half. How often, if you want, is u bigger than one half? And if uh, that, if you have a lower bound for that, you get a lower bound for u on a smaller ball. How is this proposition proven? Again, it's by the same idea of multiplying the equation. So here it's actually not the equation for u, but the equation for minus log u by a good test function and integrating by parts and then observing that the result implies such a bound. So this, you know, it, it, it sounds simple, but thinking of it, finding the right multiplier, it's, it's a little genius, uh, really what happens here. Okay, so now that we have this density estimate, we have the following picture, right? So you look at where you're on the ball of uh, radius three quarters, and you look at how much it goes above one half, and then you see that if, if it goes sufficiently, then it cannot touch zero, right? It's going to be positive in a smaller ball. So we're going to now talk about decay of oscillation. So what is oscillation? Oscillation is the difference between the soup and the inf. Right? So here we know we had assumed or may put ourselves in a situation where the inf is zero and the soup is, zero, is one in this ball of radius three quarters. So the oscillation is one. Okay, and then there's a, an obvious dichotomy which says the one half is the middle between zero and one. Either you spend a lot of time above one half or you spend a lot of time below one half. It has to be one or the other, right? So you see it's written here, either the proportion of the volume, so this is the volume, right, these bars, in the ball of radius three quarters, the proportion of the volume uh, co corresponding to points where u is above one half is more than half the volume, 
or it's the proportion where u is, uh, or it's the, the proportion is less than one half. It's, it's kind of, kind of obvious. And so, if it's above uh, one half, if it's it's above uh, one half here, you can apply the previous proposition. The density estimate tells you that the infimum in the smaller ball is now bigger than a positive constant. And if you're in this situation, then basically what you can do is you can flip the picture the other way and apply the previous proposition to one minus u. And it's going to tell you that one minus u spends kind of a lot of time, a lot of volume above one half. Uh, and then one minus u will be bounded below by a positive constant c on a slightly smaller ball. So no matter what, in either case, the oscillation in the smaller ball has decreased because it has decreased uh, at least by the value c. So it has gone from 1 to 1 minus c. Because you see, either you're now bounded below by c or you're bounded above by 1 minus c. And this constant 1 minus c, let's call it theta, is strictly less than 1, which, as I said, was the oscillation at the larger scale. So this is what decay of oscillation means. And let's see it again on a picture. Right? So in the ball of radius 3 quarter, the function really oscillates between 0 and 1. So it has to go near 0, it has to go near 1. And on the smaller ball of radius 1 half, you see the oscillation has uh, decreased. It's, it's not touching the bottom and the top as much. And now this is the crucial point, because you see, once you have that, you've, you basically you've won. The reason is, you see, you have this decay of oscillation with this constant theta strictly less than 1. And now you can iterate. In the ball of radius 1 over 2 to the k, you'll get theta to the k times the initial oscillation. OK, so if you look at now you want to get to any radius that you give yourself, any small radius, uh, you're going to see that you're going to take theta to the log of the radius. It's going to take that many steps uh, to get there. And essentially, that means you can say that in a ball of radius r, if you think of r as 1 over 2 to the k for some k, you have uh, as much oscillation as r to the alpha times the oscillation of u in the initial ball. Okay, and you see this alpha, in fact, depends on theta. And theta was given to you by the previous proposition. There is some theta. It's not very well quantified. So there is some bounds on it, but not optimal. But it depends on, uh, there are bounds depending on d and the ellipticity. And once you have obtained that, uh, it's actually quite uh, immediate to see, or quite direct to see that this means you have a C0 alpha continuity bound. Because the oscillation, uh, you know, is, is bounded by R to the alpha in the ball of radius R, and you can shift the ball as much as you want, etc. Okay, so this is, this is your crash course in the Georgie Nash Mother theory, and I, won't, I will stop giving you courses. Uh, from now on. So I want to say that um, as, as Luis described in his talks, he, this went, thanks to his work, much further than just divergence form equations. There's now whole classes of other equations to which these ideas of elliptic regularity uh, can be applied. So there is fractional Laplacian equations that he mentioned. Uh, one way to see them is, uh, there's many ways to define them, and, and Luis uh, this afternoon will uh, give much more on this. Uh, but it's, it's like this, uh, this thing about Brownian motion, but now you, uh, instead of doing Brownian motion, you do what's called an alpha-stable Levy processes, uh, which are processes where you do uh, random walks, but you can have jumps, right? And, and the, these jumps can bring you very far away. Uh, and then you look at the generator of those types of uh, diffusions. And because the jumps take you far away, it means that basically you collect information from very far. These equations are non-local. And if you want to see them as, uh, in, a, in a purely analytic uh, formulation, you see that you have to look at, uh, at differences of u, but integrate them over the whole space. 
uh, with some uh, suitable weight. Uh, that, so that's what Luis was talking about. If you like Fourier analysis, you can also think of it as a, the, the operator that corresponds to the Fourier multiplier psi to the two alpha. If you had the Laplacian, it would be in Fourier multiplying by psi to the two, but now here alpha can be a number between zero and one. And the idea is, is that just like Laplacian made you gain two derivatives, um, Laplacian to the alpha is going to make you gain alpha, alpha over two derivatives. Maybe I got that wrong. Two alpha, right? Okay. There is another class of equations here, for instance, that are called degenerate diffusions. So here it's a bit like a divergence of A grad U. But the twist is that the coefficient, uh, if you want the, the, the structure for the, for the diffusion, the coefficient depends on u itself. So it can be a function of u, just p of u, or it can be an operator uh, applied to u. And if, for instance, the difficult case is when, for instance, p of 0 is 0. Because when p of 0 is 0, it means that uh, where the solution vanishes, the diffusion coefficient also vanishes, and you sort of lose diffusion. Uh, so, um, very interesting uh, phenomena happen there. This is what happens in the porous medium equation, which is an important physical equation. So, uh, another kind of, uh, of equations on which Luis Caffarelli has worked, and, and elliptic regularity theory ideas have to be uh, developed, etc. There is a, another class that's interesting, which is elliptic systems. So you remember I talked about divergence A grad U equals zero with U, a standard function you know, from RD to R. But what happens if now U is vector valued? You know? So if U is valued in RM, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very striking that in that case, in general, you lose regularity you may lose regularity. And this, is, uh, this was observed by the Georgie, who gave a counterexample. And this led uh, him to thinking of some sort of reduced regularity theory uh, for systems or for nonlinear equations. And the idea is, well, if you lose regularity, you lose regularity. You could have points where U is discontinuous, etc. But maybe you can try to quantify how often can you be irregular. So uh, you try to prove what is now called partial regularity, which is to say, OK, the function maybe is not regular, but it's regular outside of a small set. So the bad set, the set of points where it's not regular, cannot be uh, that big, like you want to so say that it's a set of measure zero, or you want to quantify its Hausdorff dimensions, or its lengths, or things like that. So usually the way, the way that this is done is to exploit scaling properties of the equation. So basically, you know, if you have a solution of the equation, if you scale it, if you zoom by a factor, how is the equation going to modif be modified? How is it going to scale? and ideas of covering by small balls. So you want to cover the bad sets where you may lose regularity and show, you know, thanks to coverings, you can control Hausdorff dimensions and things like that. So um, this is exactly what was done in a very celebrated result of Luis Caffarelli with Bob Cohn and Louis Nirenberg. So I, it's written here as CKN, like caffarelli cohn nirenberg theorem. And what's remarkable is that this theorem is not for an elliptic equation. It's, it's for a fluid equation, the fundamental uh, equations for fluids, really, Navier-Stokes. Um, and the Navier-Stokes equation is a system because you know, it, it's an equation about the velocity field of a fluid. The velocity field is naturally a vector field. So let's look at the equation. You see ui, so the i here are for the coordinates of the vector field. One, two, three, because we want to do it in uh, real space. And it's, uh, it has time dependence. It has a Laplacian here that corresponds to the fact that the fluid has some viscosity. 
And there is something that's called the Lagrange multiplier, which is the pressure in physics. Okay, you don't have to worry too much about this. Important feature is that the, the vector field has to be divergence-free, and in order to preserve that feature, that's why you need to add this Lagrange multiplier, the pressure. But okay, the, the main point is, can we take advantage of the fact that here there is a Laplacian to uh, use the regularizing properties of Laplacian, you know, to, get, to say that there is some regularity for the solutions of this equation. Uh, so here it, it's more like the heat equation, right? You have ut, time derivative, minus Laplacian, but I didn't say it very explicitly, but the, the, whatever regularizing properties you have for elliptic equation, you also have for parabolic equations in general, for, for the heat equation, etc. Okay, so can we take advantage of this Laplacian? The problem is, you see here, you have something that's nonlinear. You have u dot gradu. And that comes to interfere. So the idea, very roughly, is that, okay, it's not linear, but if u is small, this is quadratic in u, right? so wherever u is small, u squared is negligible compared to u. So in places where u is small, you could kind of neglect this nonlinearity, and then you would be back with more or less the heat equation, and then you would have regularity. So that's a lot how regularity for nonlinear equation is handled. And the uh, point here is to find a threshold of smallness that is called now an epsilon regularity criterion, such that if some quantity is less than this epsilon, then basically you're in this linearization regime uh, and you can neglect the nonlinear part of the equation and get regularity. Okay, so it's going to be called an epsilon regularity property. And what the quantity is for Navier-Stokes, it's the natural physical quantity, it's the energy. So for Navier-Stokes, you control energy quantities which are integrals in space and time of the gradient of the velocity field squared. Okay, so you cannot have too many places where this quantity is, is large, because in total it's integrable. Right, so you, you cannot have too many uh, places of concentration of energy. So what uh, they did is they used the fact that, as I said, the energy and the equation, the various quantities involved in the equations, scale in a certain way when you localize them to small balls. So right, the idea of looking at things on small balls whose radius goes to zero is really fundamental, uh, and the, the epsilon regularity uh, quantity is expressed like this as a limit over small balls, except it's not a ball in physical space, it's a ball in space-time, so it's not really a ball, it's a parabolic uh, cylinder, because you have to scale space in a certain way and you have to scale time in a different way, in a parabolic way. So you see the parabolic cylinder is defined as a ball in space of size r, and then an interval in time of size r squared. This is because of the parabolic scaling of the equation. So now you see you integrate over a parabolic cylinder of size r, this r here. You normalize by r, and you take the limb soup as r goes to zero of that energy quantity. So there is some epsilon such that, um, you know, if this quantity is less than epsilon, things are good. And the bad ones, for which this quantity is bigger than epsilon r, well, you know, they can happen, but because you control the total energy, you cannot have too many of them. So you can sort of cover the bad set uh, by, uh, by such bad cylinder and control the size of the bad region. And this is how you get partial regularity. So the idea of doing this for Navier-Stokes was, um, was first Schaeffer's, uh, but then it was much improved in a really famous paper of Kafferly Kohn, Nirenberg, in 19, 1982. And you see this is a fairly old paper, but what is remarkable is that the regularity, the partial regularity result that they obtained then has still not been improved. It's still the best result on this equation that we have. 
So let's state the result. So you take solutions of Navier-Stokes, which are what they call suitable solutions, and I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to say they satisfy an energy inequality, which says that you know the the energy at time t uh, is controlled in terms of the energy at initial time, but they assume a local version of this. But to, to be simpler, I just wrote it like that. So you have energy control. Then there is, as I said, an epsilon, but you don't quantify too much, but there's some small number, such that if this quantity is less than epsilon, integral over a parabolic cylinder, then xt is a regular point. And the concrete corollary of this is a control, a geometric control of the singular set. So the set S of points where uh, u of xt is not uh, regular, which is not smooth or what, has Hausdorff dimension uh, five-third finite and one parabolic dimension zero. Okay, so P1 is like what you would do uh, like the Hausdorff uh, measure, but in this parabolic uh, space-time thing. Okay? So it's the partial regularity result. And the corollary of this, concretely, it means, for instance, you, you rule out a line of singularity in space-time. Okay, so imagine you have here a time, and you have here a space, and you have a point where the function is not regular. Well, that point cannot persist as a whole curve in space-time. Otherwise, you would be violating this thing of zero parabolic measure. Okay, so if you have a singularity, it cannot persist in this sort of continuous way in time. And that sort of gives you a criterion for possible blow-up of solutions of Navier-Stokes, right? If they blow up, they have to blow up in a certain way, the epsilon regularity has to be violated, etc. So you may know that you may win a million dollars by proving or disproving that uh, Navier-Stokes has smooth solutions for any given smooth initial data. So somehow this result of Kafferly Cohen Nirenberg from 1982 is still the best thing we know. Uh, short of this, of the answer to this problem. And finally, I don't know how much time I have, I'm a little lost with time. Five minutes, perfect. So I want to conclude with um, another example of application uh, of the ideas of elliptic regularity by Luis Caffarelli to another problem in fluids, actually. It's like remarkable. It's the quasi-geostrophic equation. So quasi-geostrophic equation it's another equation of fluid mechanics which was introduced as a sort of toy model for Navier-Stokes. It's supposed to have a lot of the ingredients or like the, the mathematical difficulties of Navier-Stokes so people want to understand the regularity of that before they can try to understand regularity for Navier-Stokes. I think it's also physically reasonable. But. Okay, so here is the equation. We have now a, a scalar uh, function. It's called theta now, like temperature for instance, and it's dt theta plus u dot grad theta. So you see you decouple here the, the, the velocity field and the temperature, for instance. There is a divergence-free uh, vector field, and u and theta are related by some transform, which is a singular integral operator. Here, it's, in particular, it's a Ries transform, but it's not so important. So maybe what's important to see is that you have the parabolic situation, except you don't have the Laplacian, you have a fractional Laplacian, you have the one-half Laplacian here, okay? And here you have this term u dot grad theta. So we say that the equation is critical uh, for the following reason. Laplacian one-half theta, as I told you, one Laplacian gains you two derivatives in terms of regularity, and so two Laplace, uh, sorry, one half Laplacian gives you one derivative. Okay, so you can hope here that you have a gain of one derivative. On the other hand, you have u dot grad theta kind of takes away one derivative, right? So you have one, a gain of one and you have a, a price of one, so is Laplacian to the one half going to be strong enough to regularize the equation despite 
to regularize the solution despite the presence of this first order derivative. That's why you see the, the problem is delicate. And it turns out that yes, and this was proved by Cafferly and Vasseur in a more recent paper, where they prove basically the solution is smooth. So that settled, that settles the, the question. So it's smooth, except possibly at initial time. So if you start with the with a initial data which is not so regular, possibly it immediately becomes smooth. And what is the core of the proof? The core of the proof is to first prove a C0 alpha estimate, because once you have C0 alpha, you can bootstrap with sort of more standard arguments. You can get to C infinity. But to get C0 alpha, you do exactly a kind of proof by decay of oscillation a la de Georgie, as I showed you uh, in my slides with the picture. Okay, so it's this, this idea again. All right, so I think I got to everything I wanted to say. I want to congratulate Luis again.